I told you that all you need to survive is the sun that strikes your flesh and the air you breathe? Humanity is brought down from its true potential because of all those toxins in your body, the poison that you eat and drink every day. Over a hundred thousand people have already found freedom from food and water, and they are healthier and happier than ever before. Not only that, but they have reached a higher level of spirituality. You'll be free from wanting, fearing, and anything else that doesn't help you reach a higher plane of existence. It may take years, but what's that compared to an eternity of enlightenment? Join my seminars today and learn just how to be like me. <laughs>
the starvation. And he told people that mothers who practice breatharianism didn't need to feed their babies because they already knew how to live off sun and air. I am not exaggerating. Well, does that mean that when a baby is born, you don't have to give it anything to eat, no milk or anything? No, that would only work if the mother was a breatharian. Because we don't come into the world as breatharians from mothers that are breatharian, before we even get started, our blood is poisoned. You see, we already start at a disadvantage when we're born. So because of that, a person needs to be an adult, and that's why I don't even lecture people who are young about being a breatharian. Despite competing with the many fad diets of the era, breatharianism had a large appeal to Americans. Be able to survive without food and stay fit and healthy? Who wouldn't want that? Brooks created a foundation to spread his teachings and even had some celebrity followers like Michelle Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer later went on record to say it was a financial scam. Brooks teachings were mostly in line with your standard run-of-the-mill starvation fad, but some of his claims were interesting to say the least. He advocated for sun gazing or staring at the sun in order to get nutrients. FYI, don't do that. Even as a joke, staring directly at the sun can cause severe vision damage. Do not do that. He told his followers to clean their blood before fasting by eating foods with yellow quote-unquote vibrational energy. He even said that breatharianism would keep you young and vibrant as you got older. Oh, and also that people who died from breatharianism were doing it wrong. But sadly, Brooks's world came clashing down in the year of our Lord, 1983, when while at a breatharianism convention, he either ordered a chicken pot pie at a hotel restaurant or bought Twinkies at 7-Eleven, depending on who you ask. But it's so hot. Either way, he got caught eating. What did his followers have to say about that? Most of his organization's officers resigned, along with Institute co-founder Lavelle Leffler, who had this to say about Brooks. I saw him eat an omelet. I was so shocked I didn't react. He thought he was safe and started eating around me all the time. The truth is, he sneaks into 7-Elevens and fast food places and eats just like the rest of us. Except worse, because he has to rely on places that are open late into the night. Brooks obviously took this well. Lavelle Leffler and I were romantically involved. We broke up, now she's out for revenge. What she says is a bunch of garbage. I go into 7-Elevens all the time, but only to buy magazines. I go to restaurants and to health food stores because my friends eat. No one can prove I've taken any food. Way to take responsibility for your actions, buddy! After this fallout, Brooks continued to spew the idea that living on light and air alone would keep you young, along with McDonald's, which have, I shit you not, 5D properties that keep you healthy. I highly recommend that you eat at McDonald's whenever possible. All McDonald's are constructed on properties that are protected by fifth dimensional high energy spiritual portals. As you continue to use this meditation diet program, you will start to feel the difference in the atmosphere when eating inside of a McDonald's and outside. He continued to promote his practices until his death in 2016 from non breatharian related causes. But. When one ruler falls, another must rise to the occasion and take the throne. And thus we meet the most fuck. And thus we meet the most prominent breatharian, the one who is, from my research, still at the top to this day. Jasmine. Once upon a time, there was an Australian real estate agent named Ellen Grieve. She was married, had some kids, but then through mysterious means discovered breatharianism, adopting a new name for her path in life. Jasmuheen. She became the new ruler of breatharianism in the 90s, writing books advocating for the diet and claiming all these benefits. I learned that I could program the body to maintain a desired weight and also to change its shape at will. I have learned that my body reflects my emotional state and that my emotional body 
responds directly to my thought processes. I have also learned that the emotional body is like a willful child, and just because we have decided to keep the house clean from now on through mind mastery doesn't mean we don't have to clean out the emotional baggage from past thought processes that is held within cellular memory. Or the cupboards of the attic. Her books were a hit, and she gave numerous interviews claiming she only needed light in the form of a force she called prana to survive, albeit she still consumed normal food on occasion. I normally consume maybe a few cups of tea and a glass of water, but now and then if I feel a bit bored and I want some flavor, then I will have a mouthful of whatever it is I'm wanting the flavor of. So it might be a piece of chocolate, it might be a mouthful of a cheesecake or something like that. Of course, people were skeptical, even more so when her teachings were connected to three deaths. Her response to it? About the same as Brooks, claiming that the people who died from her teachings weren't doing said teachings properly. In 1998, 60 Minutes got Jazz Maheen to agree to be filmed, practicing her teachings on tape. This went as well as you would think. By day two, there were already problems. So you're now over um, and you know, I did four. five percent dehydrated. I did four weeks today. You were pleased. Is that good? I don't know. If we let this go much longer, that's going to damage your damage your kidney. Day three, and Jasmaheen was complaining that city pollution was limiting the nutrients she was able to derive from breathing fresh air. So we agreed to move to another location. Here, Jasmaheen was happy again, but starting to look gaunt. By day four, her condition had deteriorated dramatically. Her pulse rate was up, blood pressure down, and she had lost six kilos. How are you feeling? I feel really good now I'm here. You're now quite dehydrated, probably over 10%, getting up to 11%. You might think last night was 5%. My mouth's still moist and my skin's not bad, so... But the question and is... Her eyes, her eyes are a little sunken. Her pulse is about double what it was when she started. Is she entering a dangerous period? Very much so. She claimed that the experiment failed because she wasn't receiving adequate light and air. But look, even to a layman like me, at the end of four days, I can see your body's collapsing. Will you because yet I've come to... Because I've spent two days fighting carbon monoxide poisoning. If 60 Minutes didn't put me beside the Story Bridge, the busiest main road, where, like, I asked for fresh air, like 70% of my nutrients come from fresh air. But the damage was done. She's still the so-called queen of breatharianism, though. She mostly sticks to hosting seminars and posting on her shitty-ass website that she probably got for free. to Jazz Mukin's teachings since they are the most well known. Breatharianism is the idea that you can live on nothing but, as Jazz Mukin calls it, prana. Prana originates from India, referring to a universal energy that, quote, permeates reality on all levels. Some texts say it comes from sunlight, others don't. Your mileage may vary. It's a popular term slash practice in other alternative medicine and new age things, but not in the same way as breatharianism. For example, in yoga, prana is used to achieve mindfulness and a higher level of well-being. Oh, and that actual food can provide it. Take that, Jasmine! In breatharianism, prana is all you need to live and there is a way you can sustain yourself on nothing but it. How? Well, with Jasmine's 21 day plan, of course. Well, not really. As of 2012, Jasmine tends to recommend a restrictive five year plan more, especially for the quote unquote unprepared. These days, I tend to recommend a different approach to living on light as it is a long-term 
and sensible and does not involve any difficult initiation. In this reality, for example, they set themselves in a five-year plan to slowly prepare their physical, emotional, and mental bodies, while also conditioning their family and friends to this new intended reality, for example. Year one, no more meat. Year two, become a vegan. Year three, raw food only. Year four, fruit only. Year five, juices only. Year six, prana only. During this five year period, they also plan to exercise and meditate regularly and become as finely tuned as possible, allowing them to expand their consciousness to live permanently in the divine airwaves. Also, I felt that as a leading vocal proponent of the Prana program, it needed to be offered as safely as possible with the best education regarding its total gifts with less emphasis on just the nourishment aspect. Also, 70% of people undergoing the 21-day process chose to ignore the guidelines in the book, thus potentially risking their health and needlessly damaging my reputation and polluting the true message of the Prana program. Also, also... In Brazil, I received the news that a Swiss woman died in January 2011 after being inspired by the movie In the Beginning There Was Light to do the 21-day process. Apparently, she passed through the complete initiation, okay, but was later found dead by her adult children. An autopsy revealed she died of starvation, and a further investigation revealed that she was very committed and conscious of this choice, and determined to do this regardless of the fact that we no longer support this process, and have not done so since the late 1990s. Four people have died in association with the 21-day process since 1993, over a period of 19 years. With 40,000 now safely transitioned, our statistics are phenomenal compared to the fact that millions die each year from hunger-related diseases and medical misdiagnosis. However, statistics don't help those grieving for the loss of loved ones, and any death can hinder our educational program into this field of possibility, which so many still don't understand. That's a long way to say, please don't sue me for wrongful death, woo. However, from what I've seen, the 21-day version of Jasmuheen's plan is still practiced to some extent, with her teachings being attributed to deaths as late as 2017. Breatharianism is not a new practice. It originated in various religions, most notably Hinduism, Taoism, and Jainism. Some Hindu texts had accounts of saints practicing Breatharianism, most notably in the Ramayana, which I plan to read in the near future for a different video, stay tuned, where various cantos in the third book detailed Enedia practitioners. By holy Mandrakani rot, with powers his right austere had bought, for he, great Vatarist intent, on strictest rule his stern life spent. Ten thousand years the stream his bed, ten thousand years on air he fed. Since the Ramayana is an epic like the Aeneid, this is obviously more of a legend than a historical account, but it does show context for Breatharianism. It helps that there are holidays in the religion where fasting is commonplace. In Taoism, there's Bigu, a fasting technique to achieve transcendence. It has different interpretations depending on who you ask. Some say you only need to stop eating grains, while others say you have to stop eating entirely and only sustain yourself on, quote, gulps of air. Most of what I found seemed to lean towards the former, with modern-day Bigu being allocated to low-carb or ketogenic diets. Jainism's version is the one most similar to what we're talking about today. The tradition of Salekana, which translates to thinning, involves an old and or sickly person no longer eating food. This isn't for any health benefit or for any new spiritual awakening. It's specifically a traditional way to end one's life when their time has come. 
Salaikana is still practiced to this day, and similar practices can be found in Hinduism and Buddhism. Though the latter is more of a self modification where Buddhist monks observe strict aestheticism, 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 to reach some form of enlightenment and become one with the Buddha. The true precursor to modern breatharianism, though, were the Victorian fasting girls. The most notable of these was Molly Fancher, also known as the Brooklyn Enigma. After a series of traumatic accidents, Fancher experienced a loss of physical senses, culminating in her allegedly ceasing to eat. She grew bedridden and spent the remainder of her life offering prophecies and miracles for a, quote, donation. Most other fasting girls of the time were treated similarly, kind of like circus freaks of the 19th and 20th centuries, people to be gawked at and interacted with for money. Then people got too busy fat shaming girls and dying of lung cancer to bother with fasting. Until, you know, Wiley and Giles behave, rear their ugly heads out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find, I think my pot pie is finally, you know. One question you may have about breatharianism, aside from the obvious, which we all get to, is why? What is it about breatharianism that appeals to people? Well, the people who believe in this practice, those who spend money on seminars and retreats and the like, are those who want that enlightenment those at the top, like Jazz Muheen and Wiley Brooks, peddle. They want to feel more at ease with whatever they're suffering with. In 2017, a reporter with GQ dropped in on a breatharian training summit and listed the reasons why some of the attendees were there. My husband has ALS. The diagnosis has been spiritually and logistically devastating for us both. I am desperate for something, anything resembling a treatment or cure for him too. I want to break my addiction to food. If anyone tells you they don't want to lose weight here, they're probably lying. I came to get to the next level, spiritually. So, better health, breaking addiction, spirituality? Who wouldn't want that? And fasting has been a popular way to achieve all three in the West. Personally, I think the answer is no, but I'm not a scientist. I'm just a shit poster in her early 20s who makes these videos while having a full-time job. But what actually happens to you when you practice breatharianism? Well, this is the point where I get a little bit queasy, but I'll explain as best I can. Yes, I just said I'm not a scientist, but for the sake of this explanation, just pretend I am. I did my research, goddammit! Every body is different, but the rule of thumb is that a human can only live for three days without water and three weeks without food. Since dehydration kills you faster, I'll start with that. When Jasmine quote unquote craved her lies on 60 Minutes, she started showing classic signs of dehydration. Her pupils dilated, her heart rate grew irregular, and she seemed drowsy, but she claimed that it was all because she was reaching enlightenment. Obviously, humans need water to survive. You've probably heard that the average person is 60% water, but what is that water for? It helps regulate your body temperature, protects sensitive organs, gets rid of waste products through sweat and urine, and more. By not drinking water, you are withholding a vital element of your body. Food is something you can last for longer without. Aside from the obvious weight loss from not eating, your body will eventually run out of its energy reserves, glucose for reference, and it will slowly stop working. 
your kidneys cease to function properly, your immune system loses function, and your vital organs shrink from a lack of nutrients. Your body temperature drops, your cognitive function decreases, and once your body starts using your muscles to sustain yourself, death is near. Now imagine experiencing the effects of starvation and dehydration at the same time. Doesn't sound enlightening, does it? And yet Jasmuheen is still active as of this taping. She still offers seminars and claims she doesn't need at least much food and water to survive. And that's dangerous. You can't just tell people that not eating or drinking is good for you. What else is there to say about breatharianism? It's a dangerous practice conjured up by fraudsters who couldn't care less if you lived or died, much less experienced some form of enlightenment. So don't give them your money and don't practice what they preach. Good day.